Okay. Uh, I got interrupted by my uh, by one of my children. So, and there's the other one you can probably hear. Hopefully he'll run away. Um, <laughs> uh, it's been a long quarantine, okay, and, and we've got more to go. So, anyway, uh, in this example problem, okay, we've got a series of compounds. Uh, naphthalene is the basic one, and then we have different, different derivatives uh, involving progressively heavier halogen atoms. And the observation is that the fluorescence decreases in this series, whereas the phosphorescence increases. And the reason it increases in the series is because the atoms get heavier, the, the substituents get heavier. This increases the amount of spin-orbit coupling, and as a consequence of that, that tends to favor the intersystem crossing over the vibrational, um, vibrational relaxation, uh, which leads to fluorescence. So, so the phosphorescence gets enhanced in the heavier species. Uh, another process that can occur, which is kind of interesting, is um, uh, dissociation of the molecule. So uh, you can lose the excitation if the molecule falls apart, basically. Um, and so the number of vibrational energy levels in the excited state is finite. And if you try to excite beyond that, you're going to break the molecule. And you can observe the dissociation limit in the absorption spectrum of your, uh, of your sample. And so we'll look at that first, and then we'll come back to this idea of of internal conversion in a second. So here is an example of uh, absorption where uh, dissociation is observed. So you've got your ground state, the ground vibrational state, and this is the excited electronic state, and the excited uh, and, and its various vibrational energy levels. Uh, as, you, as you undergo absorption, you see the Frank Condon progression of these, uh, of these different vibrational energy levels, and once you run out of vibrational energy levels and you go beyond the dissociation limit of the molecule, the absorption spectrum becomes continuous. And so this is the uh, hallmark of dissociation in, in absorption. I think we want to go back this way. Um, okay, the next idea, internal conversion. It's another type of non-radiative process where instead of uh, going from a singlet to a triplet or from a triplet to a singlet, you go from a singlet to another singlet state. So it's a type of radiationless uh, transfer from one, one electronic state to another, but in the case of internal conversion, the two states have the same spin multiplicity. In the case of intersystem crossing, the two states involved have different spin multiplicities. And so here is an example of that. Uh, we have uh, ground state, excited state, and then we have another excited state. Let's call it a singlet in this case. So let's suppose these are all singlets. Uh, we have two excited state singlets. You notice that one of them has a minimum in the potential energy curve, so it has bound vibrational energy levels. The other one has no minimum, and so this is a dissociated, dissociative uh, electronic state. As soon as the molecule enters that electronic state, it basically falls apart. So what you see here in the absorption spectrum, you'll see a few vibrational energy levels being resolved here, but then as you approach vibrational energy levels that couple the bound excited state to the unbound excited state, uh, what you'll have is inter internal conversion from, from one state to the other. And that's depicted here uh, in the absorption, or, it, or it's, um, it's featured in the absorption as this uh, little continuous region of the absorption spectrum. And then as you continue to probe uh, to higher energies, you'll see uh, the uh, vibrational fine structure return, and then you'll have the dissociation limit for, that, for, that, uh, for this particular singlet. So, so this is the signature for internal conversion uh, to a dissociative type of state. And I think this problem simply uh, repeats what I've just said for the specific case of, uh, of oxygen, uh, but it's the exact same story. So, so what I've just described here is exactly what's happening in this, 
in this brief illustration. So we'll move on to the last little part of the of the spectrum, or not of the spectrum of the uh, of the video. We'll talk about lasers a little bit. Um, so what we've looked at so far has been spontaneous emission. So fluorescence and phosphorescence are spontaneous emission. You can also drive the de-excitation process through stimulated emission, uh, which involves the interaction of a photon with the excited state to produce a second photon. And the cool thing about stimulated emission is that the photon that's produced has the same frequency, phase, direction of propagation, and polarization as the incident photon. And what this does uh, is it allows the, the light to be amplified, and that's, that's essentially how lasers work. In fact, that's what the acronym stands for, Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. Uh, and lasers are a very powerful tool in chemistry, physics, and, and other subjects as well. And so let's go through this table here just to highlight um, some of the characteristics of laser light as well as some of the applications. And so one, one application is that laser light can, be, can have a very high intensity. And so that's very useful for scattering type of spectroscopies where uh, the, the cross-section for scattering is quite low. You need a very intense light source in order to, uh, to create enough um, scattered light to detect it. Um, the fact that you can create a very large density of photons is also important when you have uh, processes where uh, multiple photons are needed to, to, to make the process occur, and so you need a high concentration of photons in order to, to, to observe multi-photon processes. Uh, the primary advantage um, of laser light is that it's monochromatic. Uh, if you use something like a UV lamp, that's going to give you a distribution of frequencies uh, you know, a wide range of frequencies. However, for a laser light, uh, the distribution of frequencies is much, much smaller. And so this, this allows high resolution spectroscopy to, to be conducted, uh, which as we've discussed previously, has, um, generates a, a wealth of information. Um, you can collimate laser light and as you can make uh, laser beams out of it and direct the beams, uh, you know, across a laser table in different ways, and so that, that assists with the experimental design. Uh, and then here, this is probably my favorite application of laser light, or my favorite characteristic, is that it can be pulsed, so you can, you can uh, chop up the laser beam into uh, very short bursts of laser light, high-intensity laser light, and you can control uh, the timing with which those laser pulses interact with the sample. Uh, and you can control it down to the femtosecond, and even down to the attosecond, uh, which is amazing. So you can use the laser light to study uh, explicitly uh, very fast processes like reactions, uh, like vibrational energy relaxation uh, and transfer between two different um, two different uh, systems. And so uh, th these types of experiments, although very difficult to perform, uh, generate incredible. Uh, incredible studies uh, involving um, uh, molecular dynamics explicitly. So lasers are pretty cool. Uh, one, uh, two, two characteristics or two, two things that you need in order to generate laser light. You need a metastable excited state, one that will decay by non-radiative processes, and then you need to create what's called a population inversion. So let's illustrate that using this simple four-level laser system. Okay, you, you can't generate a laser with only two levels. You need a minimum of three, but I think four is probably the best. Um, here's how it works. You've got some ulti you know, you've got some ground state here. Okay, and then you use perhaps a UV lamp, perhaps another laser, uh, you use or perhaps a, a, an electric discharge. Uh, to pump uh, molecules from this ground state to this um, uh, mesostable or quasi-stable uh, excited state. Um, and what happens is, is, is those uh, molecules that are pumped up here will uh, 
will relax through radiationless transitions to, you know, through internal conversion perhaps, uh, they will be converted to this excited state B here. And it's between the state B and A that we have the stimulated emission occurring. So the idea here is that a, a photon resonant with this, uh, with this energy transition will come by and it'll cause excited B molecules then to de-excite. And then the photon that's produced in that emission can then go on to make another B molecule de-excite and so on. And so it's like you get a chain reaction occurring. Uh, in order for this to work, you need to have a, what's called a population inversion. You need to have a higher population of molecules in this state B than you do in state A. And how you achieve that is through this pumping up to the, to the intermediate or to the unstable excited state. And then you need a sink here when molecules form in this, uh, when molecules start to populate the state A, you want them to relax down to the ground state so they can be pumped up again. And so if, if the rates of these processes are timed correctly, what you can do is you can build up a very high population uh, in this state B, and then that's going to allow you to undergo lots and lots of stimulated emission. And so every time A comes back down here, you want to send, you know, you want to send molecules back around to state B so they can, they can take part in this chain reaction. And, and that produces the laser light. Uh, this is just an example where you've got, um, uh, again, it's, it's a four or five, five uh, level laser system. It's, it's identical to what we've just described, but it's for the specific example of a neodymium uh, YAG laser. So we'll, we'll stop this one, one here.